phosphine. We're going to characterize its chemistry and physical properties and why it's a signature of life at all. We're going to talk a little bit also about the study uh, that found phosphine there and why we might be a little bit either optimistic or cautious about it, meaning there's life on Venus. For now, you can also work on this whiteboard puzzle. It also has a space theme. A little bit later, I'll tell you the answer to this Rebus puzzle. Okay, so let's jump into the details of what this molecule phosphine is. Let's go over some basic properties of the phosphine molecule. And what it is, is a molecule very similar to another molecule we're familiar with. So phosphine is a phosphorus with three hydrogens. It has this sort of trigonal pyramidal structure which means it kind of looks like a pyramid. So here's a hydrogen down to the right, here's a hydrogen down to the left, and then sort of going back into the screen here, there would be a, another H atom. And so here's the one phosphorus atom that is bonded to these three hydrogens, and you get this sort of uh, pyramidal uh, shape to this. There's also a lone pair up here on the top of the phosphorus, a lone pair of electrons. Right? And so here is the sort of uh, signature pyramidal shape of these trigonal parameter, pyramidal sorry, molecules. Now, this is quite similar to a, another molecule we're very familiar with, ammonia. NH3. Of course, there are some differences that we'll highlight, but this is a nice sort of corollary that we can imagine being more familiar with. Its structure is similar. Uh, nitrogen, of course, is right above phosphorus on the periodic table, and things of the same family of elements usually have similar properties. Okay, now phosphine, pH three, is uh, colorless. It's highly toxic, more toxic than ammonia. and very, very reactive. It's a gas at uh, room temperature and most temperatures. You have to get below about 90 degrees Celsius before it really becomes a liquid. And then negative 130 Celsius, it can be a solid. Now, one of the ways it's very different from ammonia is that it is pretty much nonpolar. And polar has to do with how these uh, atoms share the electrons in these chemical bonds. So inside this line right here is really two electrons that signifies this chemical bond, these shared electrons. Now in something like ammonia, the nitrogen atom is much more electronegative and, and tends to hog the electrons near it. But phosphorus and hydrogen really have quite similar uh, electronegativities. And so the bond here is really covalent in nature. It's, it's not that the phosphorus is hogging a whole bunch of these uh, electrons here, but rather that it's a, a shared bond between these two. And that makes it nonpolar. So there's not a bunch of extra negative charge density, density around phosphorus and an extra positive charge density uh, around hydrogen like you might have in the molecule of ammonia. The bond energies here are quite high, um, even higher than ammonia. So it's, it's pretty hard to break these bonds. And so it's, it's a pretty stable compound in that respect. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to create these bonds, but once created, uh, they're gonna liberate a lot of energy when they're broken. One other telltale sign of pH three is that it's smelly, kind of like garlic or rotten fish, but this is really thought to be due to a associated gas, uh, P2H4, which is hard to separate out. So if you have a, a bottle of uh, pH3, it usually is accompanied with some P2H4, and that's what gives it this sort of uh, similar smell. 
Uh, likewise, when it's created in nature, a lot of times you might also see this P2H4. Now, how do we make phosphine, right? How does it occur in nature and how might we make it in the laboratory? Uh, like I said, the bonds here are very stable. It takes a lot of energy to make these phosphorus hydrogen bonds. Similarly, it takes a lot of energy to make the nitrogen hydrogen bonds in ammonia. And remember, ammonia was not something that was always easily to be made. Uh, the Haber-Bosch process is what, uh, uh, in the early 1900s, allowed us to make a lot of NH3 and gave us fertilizers to help feed the world. So that Haber-Bosch process takes place 100 times the pressures normally found on Earth and 400 degrees Celsius. So it's kind of extreme in the same way it takes extreme environments to uh, make these pH3 molecules. So in the lab, we can make this uh, a couple different ways. Uh, we can make this, we'll call this the synthesis of pH3. We can make this by combining something called white phosphorus, which is this uh, tetrahedral P4 molecule. Okay, And you can combine this with uh, sodium hydroxide in a 3 to 1 ratio. Uh, you can also have, or should also have, a water around in this process. And these will react in such a way to make your phosphine molecule, as well as some of this sodium mixed with this phosphite-looking molecule here, H2PO2. Okay, and so th this should have a three in front of it as well, so now at least it's balanced with four phosphorus on each side. And so this is one route to make this. Now, this has to be done under CO2, okay? It can't be done under oxygen. You can't have oxygen around because if oxygen's around, it's going to burn with P4, right? And it's going to burn with pH3, okay? You can make hydrogen gas in that process, which is flammable. And so in order to get any amounts of phosphine you would want in the laboratory, you usually have to do this under some other atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is the most beneficial. And as we'll talk about later, the atmosphere of Venus has a lot of carbon dioxide in it. Uh, another way you might make this is calcium phosphide. In this sort of reaction to make calcium hydroxide. And then your phosphine here. This is actually the reaction known in maritime world as a home signal. Basically, to alert other ships you might have a problem or you're going down or not to collide with us, uh, you have a bucket of calcium phosphide right, or a box of calcium phosphide. Uh, that is porous, ha has a hole in it. You chuck this into the ocean, you make pH 3, and oxygen is around in the atmosphere, so this phosphine reacts quickly and ignites with the oxygen and sends off this bright red flame that other boats can see. Okay, And so that's called a home signal, relying on this uh, really production of phosphine. Now, uh, this can also be done, you could write uh, something similar, but with HCl. Okay, so in acid, you can make this phosphine as well uh, instead of with water, but with an acid like hydrochloric acid. Obviously, you'll make some calcium chlorides instead over here. So this isn't uh, quite the same, I suppose. You get calcium chloride and you'll have to do some balancing, but you can make this with an acid instead of just plain water. And remember, up here we said uh, this is interesting because the atmosphere of Venus has a lot of carbon dioxide. This route is interesting because the atmosphere of Venus has a lot of acids, albeit not hydrochloric, I don't think, mostly sulfuric. And so there are a lot of ways perhaps you could make uh, phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, although you would have to have these other compounds around. So these are sort of the, the ways we make this in a man-made sense in the uh, laboratory. Um, there's also naturally occurring ways, anaerobic bacteria we'll talk about shortly, uh, make this, and you also get it from the breakdown of just organic matter, okay? Uh, phosphine uh, reacts quickly with oxygen, producing flammable 
hydrogen gas. Okay, that's part of the process that's used in the home signal here. That's why this, once you create it, combines with oxygen in the atmosphere to light on fire. Right? Uh, it can react with uh, chlorine gas. To make a series of phosphorus chlorides like trichloride or pentachloride. Okay, it's pretty stable. This this pH three molecule that you get uh, doesn't really dissociate until very high temperatures. And by dissociate, I mean fall apart. You break these phosphorus hydrogen bonds. Okay, it's a gas, but if it's in a really extreme environment, that gas can sort of fall apart into individual phosphorus atoms and hydrogen atoms. Okay, so it dissociates uh, at 450 degrees Celsius. Now, the atmosphere of Venus is, is quite diverse, and at the surface of Venus, temperatures much higher than this, or in this range, I should say, uh, exist, but up in the atmosphere, the temperatures are usually much colder, and so this pH 3 can be long-lived in the atmosphere of Venus because you're not at these temperatures. Some other ways uh, that you can make pH 3, and we've touched on it uh, briefly, is that uh, the, this pH 3 is a common product, not super common, but we know of a lot of different uh, species, uh, I should say, or, or types, I should say, of bacteria that feature this. It's a common product from bacteria. So sort of naturally produced by bacteria. Uh, but I should note, you know, this is anaerobic bacteria. So again, bacteria that have evolved without oxygen. Right, so aerobic would be oxygen around, anaerobic means there's no oxygen around. And so early on in the history of the Earth, when there's not a lot of oxygen around, we had a lot of bacteria that were using things like methane uh, as part of their chemical synthesis. And pH 3 is a product of some of these anaerobic bacteria. And we still have these on Earth in certain regions, right, where oxygen is not around, uh, and they're producing pH 3 uh, naturally. So this is a common product from bacteria. That's why it would be a signal of life, uh, perhaps uh, in Venus. Uh, you also found uh, or find pH 3 in some aerobic species, but it's not that it's made naturally by those organic species like fish and penguin, but it's found as sort of a um, product of decaying organic matter. So uh, found in decaying organic matter. As an example, you can find it in the feces of penguins or some types of fish in their guts. Right, so it's not a uh, compound that animals are are naturally making to use themselves because it's quite toxic to aerobic organisms. Uh, but it is a natural sort of uh, product of some decaying organic matter. Okay, so those are some properties of uh, phosphine. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about uh, Venus's atmosphere so that we get more of an understanding of, you know, can this phosphine really be found there? Uh, looks like yes, based on the recent results. Um, why is it likely that it is found there? And why might, be, might we be a little bit uh, cautious about uh, assuming it definitely means there's life there? Okay, so let's think a little bit about Venus's atmosphere. Okay, uh, it's something like 96% CO2, 3% nitrogen, and you know, 1% of all these other things, some of which might be pH three, okay? The surface temperature is 470 degrees Celsius on surface, right? But drops considerably down to zero Celsius at around 50 kilometers up into the atmosphere. 
The pressure on Venus is about 92 times the pressure of Earth. Again, on the surface, but drops to Earth pressure around 50 to 60 kilometers up. Okay, and I'm highlighting that region of the atmosphere because this is where the phosphine was found. There's no magnetic field on Venus, like Earth has a naturally occurring one, right? And that's because Venus doesn't have this internal dynamo, right? Like we have this nickel iron core that gives us this magnetic field on Earth uh, that protects us from some uh, strong particles from the sun. Now, Venus doesn't have that internal dynamo, so it doesn't have a naturally occurring magnetic field, but it does have an induced one, right? And an induced one comes from the sun, okay? Light from the sun can ionize some of the gases in Venus's atmosphere, and those charged particles now create a magnetic field of their own, thus shielding Venus from additional uh, harmful magnetic particles from the sun. Uh, also on Venus, you have clouds of sulfuric acid, right? So we talked about earlier why that might come into play because one of the routes to phosphine synthesis is through acid. Uh, it, it's fairly chaotic in terms of the winds and the convection in the atmosphere. 220 miles per hour at least has been measured in the atmosphere of Venus. and so. You know, I just want to highlight that it's uh, much denser and hotter than Earth at the surface, but 50 to 65 kilometers up. The pressure and temperature are, are quite similar to Earth. Um, now, there is a lot of crazy chaotic winds that's mixing through the atmosphere. Uh, it's an acidic environment. And so while overall, uh, it's quite a bit different from Earth. And thus, there might be some chemistry we don't fully understand to explain pH 3. You know, there is this region of the atmosphere that might be hospitable to life. Okay, so that's the atmosphere of Venus, 50 to 65 kilometers up is exactly where phosphine was detected by these astronomers out of Cardiff and MIT. Which was in this theorized hospitable zone. So we already knew sort of the temperature and pressure throughout Venus's atmosphere, but that region of the atmosphere that could be hospitable uh, to life is in this region where phosphine ends up being detected. Now, the lead author of this study about phosphine has really spent many years trying to find routes to make pH 3, right? And so, you know, they note that pH 3, you know, isn't really created from sources that don't come from living organisms, at least on rocky planets. So remember up here, we talked about how we might create it in the lab, right, from these types of reactions, but these things all don't really that often come together in the atmospheres of planets like Venus, Mars, or Earth. Right? So we have to artificially create those conditions. They do come from anaerobic bacteria or decaying organic matter, but both of those are signatures of life. And that's why this is such big news that, you know, this molecule was discovered on another planet where we don't think there is life necessarily, because it's not really created from any source except living organisms. There is one caveat to that, right? And the caveat is that There can be 
very extreme environments. And by extreme, I mean really crazy temperatures and pressures. Like Saturn and Jupiter, right? These ga gas giants where you really have crazy, crazy amounts of pressure that might be able to give you this phosphine. But Venus doesn't really have that condition. So the only, you know, suitable way to make phosphine that we know about based on all of our knowledge of chemistry is through a living organism, right? And that's why it's so exciting. We think it's a spectroscopic signature of life. We found it now in the Venusian atmosphere, the atmosphere of Venus. And so that's why many are convinced that finding it in this hospitable range dictates there is some sort of probably anaerobic species, right? That's living in this acidic environment, creating this phosphine. I do want to put a caveat at the end here. You know, there are lots of not as extreme as Saturn and Jupiter, but extreme places with regard to the acidity of Venus, with regard to the temperature and pressure as it compares to uh, Earth, right? And the crazy convection throughout the atmosphere. And so there's a chance that, you know, this pH3 that we're finding in the Venusian atmosphere is not actually from a living species, but just from chemistry we don't quite understand. And that would be okay too. It would add to our knowledge base of what is possible in chemistry. So uh, with that, I'll just share with you that the uh, puzzle here on the whiteboard today was a star in binary. So it's a binary star. And we do puzzles like this, as well as talking about uh, science news and do chemistry lectures over on Twitch on my channel, twitch.tv slash profmelco. That'll do it for this video. See you guys next time.